The Honourable Liz Bajat. And I would uh, remind members that this is the Honourable Member's inaugural speech and the usual courtesies should be followed as well. The Honourable Liz Bajat. Thank you, Mr President. And I congratulate you on your election. And I look forward to working closely with you over the next four years as I strive to make a positive and worthwhile contribution to the people of Western Australia as one of their elected parliamentary representatives. I also congratulate the Honourable Matt Benson on his election as Deputy President and Chairman of Committees and look forward to working with him also. At this stage I'd like to pass on a huge vote of thanks to the Clerk of the House, Mr Malcolm Peacock, and the Deputy Clerk, Nigel Lake, and all the other officers of the Legislative Council for their expert advice and guidance during our induction sessions and the first sitting weeks, which has ensured that we new members haven't made complete fools of ourselves straight away. No doubt, in some instances, that will come later and of our own making. I do not know if I can fully express in the time allotted to me what it actually means to have been elected to this House and what an honour it is to stand here today introducing myself as an elected representative of the North Metropolitan Region. I thank the electors for entrusting me with their votes. Before I proceed further with introducing myself to the House, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and pay tribute to two former members of the North Metropolitan Region who both served this House and indeed the State of Western Australia in an exemplary manner over a number of years. I refer, of course, to the Honourable Ray Halligan and the Honourable George Cash. Of course, if it wasn't for the retirement of these two esteemed gentlemen, I wouldn't be standing here before you today. So for that, I thank them, but the State of Western Australia owes them both much more than my thanks. I've long admired Ray Halligan's energy and enthusiasm with which he undertook his duties, especially in the area of participating and strongly advocating for a large number of the ethnic communities and organisations based in the North Metropolitan Region and indeed throughout the state. Ray served as Shadow Minister for Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs for a number of years, and it was a role that he undertook with great pride and professionalism. The welfare and well-being of migrants and the advancement of ethnic interest groups is a subject that I am particularly interested in, and if I can make a contribution in that area that comes even close to that of Ray Halligan's, then I will be very happy. I also know that Ray made a great contribution within the parliament, serving on and chairing various committees from the day he was elected in 1997 right up until the expiration of his term last month. I wish him well in his future pursuits, and I will not say his retirement, because he will, I'm sure, still be making a valued contribution to public life in all his future endeavours. With regard to the Honourable George Cash, it is indeed with much pride that I claim him as a friend, a mentor and a close confidant. George was also a colleague and friend to my father, the late John Williams, who was a member of this house for 18 years. I will speak more about Dad later on, but for the moment I want to pay tribute to George and to thank him from the bottom of my heart for the advice and guidance he has given to me over the years, but particularly in the last 15 months when I made my decision to seek pre-selection for the 2008 state election. I have a very deep fondness for George and have valued the experiences we have shared over a long period of time. Growing up as a young Liberal during the 70s and 80s, George was also an enthusiastic supporter of our causes. And I know that a number of my friends who have gone on to serve in parliaments both here and in Canberra hold George in high regard and still seek out his guidance and counsel today and will continue to do so for a very long time. In fact, George returned to this place only days after his retirement to conduct a most worthwhile session for the newly inducted members of this House. And to all of those new members, I can wholeheartedly recommend that they take the time to read the valedictory remarks made by George and take good note as to what he said about the workings of this chamber and the parliament in general. We all have a lot to learn. Without my own father here today to give me the advice I would seek about political life, I'm lucky to count George as one of my friends and, in some ways, my surrogate father. Again, I will not wish him well in retirement, but wish him well in all his future pursuits, which I know will be many and varied. Thank you, George. 
And I'd also like to make mention of George's daughter, Michaelia, who is today an extremely hard-working and popular member of the Australian Senate, representing Western Australia in the federal sphere. And it's evident that the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree, and the comparisons that are made between Michaelia and George are inevitable, but I know they are both very proud of their achievements and neither would mind being compared to the other. Michaelia has also given me invaluable advice and support in the months leading up to my election, for which I sincerely thank her, and she is certainly her father's daughter. And now, let's talk about me. As I alluded to earlier, I have a keen interest in the welfare and well-being of migrants and ethnic communities in Western Australia. The main reason for this is that I am a migrant with a proud Welsh heritage and I'm married to a migrant, an Iranian who I met whilst I was living in England and he was in France. The story of how we got together is something for another time. We were married in Amiens in France and we both came back to live in Australia in 1992 and in 1994 my husband became an Australian citizen. citizen. I had taken citizenship with the rest of my family in 1975. Our son is a first generation Australian. Most recent statistics from 2007 show that a large proportion of people living in the North Metropolitan Region, well over 55%, are originating from Europe. The largest of these groups, without doubt, have an Anglo-Saxon Celtic background, and this is the group to which I belong. Although my parentage is Welsh, I was born in England. Perhaps today it's not politically correct to use the term 10 pound pom, but I don't see it as a derogatory phrase, phrase, and it's exactly what I am. Although I was reminded by my sister a few weeks ago that it was mum and dad who paid the 10 pounds and the three kids came free. So in reality, I suppose it makes me a freeloader and some would say quite appropriate for a politician. I apologise if I offend anyone with the use of the phrase 10 pound pom, but honourable members will come to learn over the next few years that I do not always do or say what is politically correct because I sincerely believe that we've gone overboard in the politically correct arena in recent times and we need to return to a time when common sense and mutual respect prevailed automatically without compulsion or legislation being necessary. I came to Western Australia on board the Castel Felice, arriving on the 6th of July, 1966, as a seven-year-old with my family, mum and dad, my older sister, Bronwyn, and my younger brother, Rick, both in the gallery tonight. I remember our arrival at Fremantle most vividly, especially the excitement amongst all the children on board when we first saw the lights of the city that was to become our home. The novelty in the very early hours of that morning of the arrival soon wore off when we realised that in order to go through the necessary migration, quarantine and other sorts of checks, we had to stand in alphabetical order and therefore, being the Williams family, the W's were waiting in line for quite some time. Apart from being a traditionalist, it's probably one of the reasons I took my husband's surname when we married, because now, being a beige at, the B's are always right up there near the front. Thank goodness times have changed and today migrants arriving in Australia are processed in a much more timely and welcoming fashion, as long as they arrive using the legal channels available to them. Unlike many of our fellow passengers, we did not have to go to Greylands Migrant Hostel, for which I am extremely thankful, having visited families who did end up going there. We were fortunate enough to have relatives already in Perth who had arranged a house for us to move into straight away. It was, however, a great source of amusement to us children to learn that the house is in a place called Inaloo, a suburb name that for obvious reasons has always been a constant source of amusement to visitors and young children alike. Today, I'm very proud to say that Inaloo is part of my electorate and I'm very happy to represent the good folk of that area, something I certainly did not dream of way back in the 1960s when I attended North Inaloo Primary School which today is known as Uluma Primary, and I have very fond memories of my primary school years at that school. The rest of my formative years from 1971 onwards were spent growing up in Floriate Park, and I attended Churchland Senior High School for most of my high school year after one year at Scarborough Senior High. 
I have over the years worked in several different areas, including the law, as a paralegal specialising in conveyancing and commercial law, in the racing industry, working in a thoroughbred bloodstock agency, in the hospitality and gaming industry in Tasmania and here in Perth, as the pre-opening coordinator and guest services manager of the Burswood Casino. And for the past 11 years, I've worked as an electorate officer for several federal members of parliament. As you can see, I've had a varied and quite diverse career path, which I believe will stand me in good stead for this new chapter of my working life. But why the Legislative Council? In 1971, my father, John Williams, was elected to the Legislative Council as a representative of what was then the Metropolitan Province. That entire province is today encompassed in the North Metropolitan Region, and I am incredibly proud to say, and those of you who read Inside Cover this morning got the scoop, that I am led to believe that I am the first Liberal woman in Western Australia, if not the whole of Australia, who represents the same electorate as her father, and it will be a badge of honour that I will I am very proud to wear. I know Dad would be extremely proud of me if he was with us today. As a 12-year-old, I sat in the gallery where a number of my friends are sitting this evening and had thought that one day I'd like to sit down there in one of those big red chairs. And today is the fulfilment of that dream. And words cannot describe the immense pride and humility I feel at this moment. Today I join a small group of Liberal women who have been and still are fortunate to serve as members of the Legislative Council. Since the formation of the Council, there has been a total of 334 members. And of that number, only 38 are women. Of that 38, there are 11 women who have come from the Conservative side of politics, and I am one of them. I know that's not a great number, but I'm proud to say that our numbers are growing and we've achieved this through the Liberal Party pre-selection process on our own merits and are not subject to any tokenism or affirmative action as may be the case in other political parties. Although we lost one of our Liberal women at the last election with the retirement of the Honourable Barbara Scott, who I pay tribute to also, we've gained two at this election with being myself and the Honourable Alyssa Hayden from the East Metropolitan Region. And it's interesting to note today that the East Metropolitan Region, there are five women members. And so the Honourable Jock Ferguson over there is in very good company, making up the token male of that region. <laughs> and I think that with the male-female ratio of the House now standing at almost 50-50, we're in for some very interesting times. As I said previously, our early days in Australia were exciting. And it was fun growing up in a neighbourhood full of kids when it was in a time when it was safe to run around the streets and local parks without our shoes on, and without fear of treading on a hypodermic or being abducted or assaulted or exposed to stranger danger. Growing up in those days, a stranger was just a friend you hadn't met yet, and sadly, we cannot say the same thing today. There has without a doubt been an increase in violent crime in recent times, and I know that law and order is a huge issue in the electorate, and I'm pleased to be part of a government that intends to address these issues. I do not intend to expand on this area today because the problems are probably larger than the time allotted, but I'll be working closely with the Attorney General and Minister for Police to make a positive contribution in the months and years to come. But change cannot be brought about by legislation alone, and there has to be a change in attitudes as well. The Huckleberry Finn idyllic childhood is something that has been missing from our neighbourhoods for many years, but I'm pleased to say that slowly in some areas, especially in the streets where we live, in Madeley, there is a return to the games of street cricket and tennis and children playing safely in their front gardens. I think the revival of play playing out in the street with your friends could be due in part to the welcome return of some of the old-fashioned values such as respect for your elders and peers that seem to have been lacking in the latter part of the 20th century. But if the attitudes and deeds of the generation that my 11-year-old son belongs to is anything to go by, then we are starting to see definite change. Attitudes are changing. I'm encouraged by some of the programs that are being run in our schools today, such as the Virtues Project, 
which I am familiar with through my son who attends Ashdale Primary School, a government school in the suburb of Darch, another great area of the North Metropolitan Region. Each fortnight, the students, under the guidance of their teachers and their peer support groups, concentrate on learning and practising one of the virtues from the project. The virtues are too numerous for me to list today in total, but examples are caring, compassion, consideration, diligence, enthusiasm, honesty, humility, humour, loyalty, justice, unity. And so the list goes on. In fact, when I was looking through the list to prepare for today's speech, it struck me that the virtues I've just mentioned are ones that we as members of parliament should adopt and adhere to, especially when it comes to the way in which we frame legislation and deal with each other during our debates and future deliberations. I can highly recommend the full list of virtues to all members and I'm happy to pass it on as compulsory reading afterwards if you wish. Some of you may think it's an indictment on parents today that it's our teachers who are teaching our children the virtues and not the parents themselves. But perhaps some of these parents were not brought up this way and they in turn will now be learning from their children. And this is not a bad thing. I would like to pay tribute to all those who have taken up the vocation of teaching and affirm that you are a precious commodity charged with the education of our future generations. And I know that you all undertake your commitment to your vocation with the utmost pride and professionalism. I know I still think fondly about a number of my teachers from school days, and I thank them for the values they helped, together with my parents, to instill in me. In today's hectic and electronic society, we must ensure that we carry forward with us those old-fashioned values such as good manners, respect and caring for each other. These are values that we must all hold dear to us no matter what avenues we pursue in our daily life. If we do not maintain respect for ourselves and our fellow Australians, regardless of their creed, religion or colour, then what hope have we got of maintaining the peace and fantastic lifestyle that we all enjoy today? The lifestyle we enjoy is made richer and more interesting by the influx of the many varied ethnic groups that today form the diverse community to which we all now belong. It began back in the 1940s and 50s with the Italian and East European migrants fleeing post-World War II Europe looking for a fresh new start. They brought with them their traditional values, love of family and of course the skills and work ethics that saw much of the Osborne Park Balcata area of the region quickly transformed to the market gardens and small businesses that flourished for a number of decades. Of course, they also brought with them the wonderful cuisines of their regions, and if there's one thing that Australians have embraced wholeheartedly, it is the food and cafe lifestyle that our climate lends itself to so well. The 60s and 70s were not only a time for the 10-pound poms to be arriving, but the late 70s also brought to our shores the Vietnamese fleeing the oppressive regime, and unfortunately the violation of human rights in that country continues today. And I'd like to acknowledge the tireless efforts of two people from my electorate, Hugh Tran and Dan Nguyen, who I was lucky to come to know through my immediately, immediate past employer, the hard-working federal member for Stirling, Michael Keenan, when he advocated, along with these men, for members of the Viet Thanh who were being imprisoned by the communist regime. Again, this ethnic group brought with them strong family values and work ethics and they continue to develop the market gardening industry that is still going strong today. A visit to the Wanneroo markets, again in the North Metro region, on any weekend gives testament to this. In more recent times, we have seen the arrival of people from the Middle East, the Horn of Africa and India. All of these groups are making a new home for their families whilst passing on to our community their diverse languages, cultural history, cuisines and skill sets. Western Australia can only become richer for the contribution made by all of these groups. However, it has long been recognised that these different ethnic groups need support from the government in order to not only keep alive their heritage and traditions, but also to assist them in integrating into Australian society. 
It is vitally important that we allow these groups to maintain their own cultural identity, but they must also be recognised as fellow Australians, not just by becoming citizens, but by acceptance from the community and integration into the Australian way of life. Funding for programs offered by the various ethnic groups, the ethnic associations, to assist in their integration has, up until the election of the Barnett government, been a bit of a hit and miss affair, and it was the squeakiest wheel that seemed to get the most oil. There also appeared to be a lack of accountability for funding received and criticism levelled at the leadership of organisations that often seemed to have their own personal agendas for advancement that often promoted their own views before representing the views of their membership. Under the guidance of um, the Minister for Citizenship and Multicultural Interests, the Honourable John Castrilli, we've seen long overdue reform to the way funding is delivered to ethnic groups through the advent of the Ethnic Organisations Fund. It is clear to the government that multicultural communities themselves clearly want change. After a series of extensive consultations, the funding model has been developed to allow triennial rather than annual funding, which gives the various ethnic groups more time to get on with delivering their programs instead of having to continually focus on applying for funding each year. These changes have been welcomed by the majority of ethnic community groups and is seen as a positive step to assist in the empowerment and advancement of these ethnic groups, something which has been lacking over the past decade. I look forward to working closely with the Minister and all ethnic groups in my electorate to deliver the best possible outcomes to help them become more at home in our community. One of the great things about being a member of the Legislative Council is that we're, all, we're able to use all of our life's experiences to add value to our deliberations and decisions concerning the lives of all West Australians, not just limited to those in the metropolitan area. This brings me to the part of my story that's about the Pilbara a place which I hold dear for a number of reasons. In 2005, my husband took up a posting with the Australian Customs Service in Dampier, and we were very happy to fully embrace the wonderful lifestyle that can be enjoyed in towns such as Karratha, where we lived. Of course, we were very lucky because housing at a very reasonable cost was provided to us as part of the deal. I'm fully aware that affordable housing for those who work in areas other than large mining companies and government departments is at a premium, but it's something that I'm glad to say is being addressed by our current government in a number of ways. We were originally meant to be in Karratha for three years, but we only stayed 15 months. Our time was cut short for a couple of reasons, but the main one was that due to a lack of medical facilities and associated support for families, we were unable to get the treatment required for our son for what was a relatively minor medical problem. Minor if you live in Perth, but disastrous if you live in the Pilbara. So we made the only decision that we could, and that was to return to Perth. We were lucky because we had the choice However, there are many families living in that region that can't make the choice, and we need families to stay in the Pilbara. So it is incumbent on us as a government to make it better for them. And I was delighted to see significant funding committed to the upgrade of the Nicol Bay Hospital in Karratha in the most recent budget. And no doubt the Royalties for Regions program will continue to deliver better services in all of those areas in the coming years. I was speaking with friends in Karratha recently and they are excited about the future under the Liberal National Alliance. Mr President, I do not bring to this place any fantastic blueprints, plans or grand schemes for the future of Western Australia. I will leave that part to others more qualified than I. However, I'm certain that under the guidance and with the foresight and planning of our current Liberal government, I will be able to contribute to the groundwork that will see some wonderful advancements and developments made in both physical and social infrastructure that will improve our already great way of life. I'm extremely excited about the plans to sink the railway line in the centre of Perth in order to join the city to Northbridge. The future for this area is exciting and will certainly help breathe life into an area that can only currently be, des be described as an eyesore in an otherwise beautiful city. I'm also excited about plans to develop the foreshore of the Swan River. 
not in a fantastic or futuristic way, perhaps as muted by the previous government, but in a way that is in keeping with the relaxed, laid-back lifestyle that we cherish here in Perth. I would certainly like to see more places for families to gather and recreate, but I'd also like to see us develop more than just a Ferris wheel and a bell tower to encourage tourists to come here and spend time at or on the Swan River. We need more casual dining and accommodation that utilises what the area has to offer. As the City of Perth is contained within the North Metropolitan Region, I will save more detailed discussions of future plans for another time. But I'm also looking forward to developments that will be put in place along the coastal areas of my electorate, in, in particular redevelopment of the Scarborough waterfront area under the care and guidance of the hard-working popular member for Scarborough, my colleague from the other place, Lisa Harvey. The proposal for the Ocean Reef Marina development is also exciting and one I know that Albert Jacob has worked diligently for in his previous life as a councillor for the City of Joondalup and now as the member for Ocean Reef. All of these developments will be good for residents and tourists alike. Ours is a vibrant state that needs to move forward in the way of development whilst remaining conscious of the fragile ecosystem along the coast, but I think we can achieve this through collaboration and cooperation between the various interest groups. Mr President, what I do bring with me today is a sense of immense pride, gratitude and anticipation. I'm proud to be a member of the Liberal Party, proud to be part of the Colin Barnett government and incredibly proud to be a member of the Legislative Council. The gratitude I feel is firstly to my parents, John and Sylvia, for giving me a wonderful start in life, and to my sister Bronwyn, brother Rick and their spouses James and Sue, who together with their children and my husband and son, make up a family that is full of love, laughter, guidance, friendship and the occasional squabble. Gratitude secondly to my friends, many of whom are here tonight in the gallery, and in particular, I mention my dear personal friends, Kim and Penny Keogh, Wendy Gillen and Rachel Turnsek, Lisa and Hal Harvey and Betty and Jack in the gallery there, Mark Trowell and Chris Lawford. Thank you for being my friends and for keeping me grounded and in touch with reality, something I hope you will continue to do well into the future. I express my thanks and gratitude to the members of the Liberal Party who sat on my pre-selection committee and were willing to listen to my request for them to be bold and to choose a representative who may not have been the one they originally had in mind. I promise not to let you down. And special thanks also to Daniel Blaine, Robin Nolan and the Liberal Women's Council. Your support is much appreciated. I would also like to pay tribute to two of the federal members of parliament who I previously worked for. And I'm very proud to say that I worked for the former Senator Chris Ellison and the current member for Canning, Don Randall. To, to Chris and to Don, both of you have played a pivotal role in my journey to this place and I sincerely thank you both for your guidance friendship and encouragement in seeking my own political career. Thank you also to the members of the Stirling Division of the Liberal Party, my home division, especially Marie Grout and Anne Johnson, both wonderful women who continue to amaze us all with their enthusiasm and drive, especially when it comes to elections and fundraising activities. I also acknowledge the Honourable James Clarko, a former Speaker of the Legislative Assembly who is here tonight and was a great friend of my dad's and was one of my referees for pre-selection. Thank you, Jim. I make mention of my staff, my electorate officer, Lisa Yarwood, and my research officer, Mark Davidson, who have made the leap of faith to join Team Bejat. I thank you for the commitment you have shown already and I hope that ours is a long and happy association. There are so many more people that I could thank but time does not permit and I'm frightened that I would leave someone out. One of the drawbacks of being a migrant, married to a migrant, is that at times like this not all of your family and friends can be with you 
And tonight I, spend, I send a special message to everyone watching on the internet in England and Wales, and especially to my great uncle Arthur. Everyone needs an uncle Arthur. And to my dear friends and family in Nashville and Iran, I love you all and wish you were here. I've saved the most important bit until last. To my wonderful husband, Reza, and my darling son, Ali. Without your unfailing and unconditional love and support that you both give to me, none of this today would have been possible. You are both my treasured loves, and I thank you for believing in me. I promise in front of all these witnesses tonight to never lose sight of the fact that you are the most important people in my life, and without you, I am nothing. We are on this journey together as a team, and I love you both very much. And finally, Mr. President, the anticipation of what the future holds is enormous as I embark on this latest journey, which is a fulfilment of a lifelong ambition. I promise that I will faithfully serve the people of Western Australia as their representative in this place for as long as they will permit me, and I look forward to a long and happy association with you all. Thank you.